Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 111 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Jennifer O'Leary. Jennifer is an award-winning investigative reporter for BBC Northern Ireland's current affairs program called Spotlight. She has investigated a wide variety of stories, including money laundering by organized crime, a criminal conspiracy to export horses unfit for human consumption into the food chain, and the secret intelligence war between the state and the IRA. I invited Jennifer onto the podcast after reading her new book, The Padre. It's the story of Father Patrick Ryan, a Catholic priest who helped funnel weapons and money from Muammar Gaddafi in Libya and the Irish Republican Army during the Troubles. Jennifer was the first person that Father Ryan ever opened up to publicly about his incredible story, and I'm very excited to discuss it with her today. After you listen to the episode, you can download a free copy of the prologue to Jennifer's book, The Padre. Just click the link in the show notes of this episode to have it emailed to you and start reading right away. But before we dive into this story, I want to ask you something. Are you an amateur military historian like me? Has this podcast rekindled your interest in Eastern Europe and the Cold War? Maybe you are finally getting into reenacting and living history just like you've always said you would. If so, you should check out the incredible collection of surplus military goods at krishiki.com. Kruss himself scours the continent for the best uniforms and field equipment available and delivers them right to your door. He's got almost anything you can imagine and many things you haven't. Uniforms from East Germany, the Soviet Union, and modern-day Bulgaria, Poland, and Russia are all available. Rucksacks, mess kits, and load-bearing gear are also up on the site right now. The inventory is constantly changing, so you never know what kind of gems you might stumble on, all at very affordable prices. Find it all at krushiki.com. That's K-R-U-S-C-H-I-K-I.com. And use the discount code SPYCRAFT101 for 10% off your order. Jennifer, thank you for being here today. Thank you. And thank you, Justin. Absolutely. I haven't had too many opportunities yet to discuss anything related to the Troubles, but every time that I have, it's been an amazing experience and it's been a really big hit with my listeners. So I'm you know, really grateful for the chance to read your book and get in touch with you about it ultimately. No, thank you. And I'm delighted to speak to you. Well, thanks. So what is it that led you to this story in the first place? Well, as you outlined in your introduction, I'm a journalist based in Belfast in in Northern Ireland. And some years ago, I was working on an IRA related story and I was having coffee with a source who passed. I suppose at the time, it was a throwaway remark about an IRA story and an an individual that I should try and track down. And he said his name is Ryan. I doubt he'll talk but you should have a go. And I wrote down the name in a corner of the notebook and it didn't kind of go anywhere for a couple of years because, you know, I was working on other stories and other deadlines. And then I was working on a series leading up to 2019 about the about the troubles. And I was working on that series and it was only through a cold call to somebody I didn't know who eventually started to talk about this Patrick Ryan, this former Catholic priest who had been this diplomat fixer, if you like, between the Gaddafi regime in Libya and the IRA. I remember this individual was talking about this person who he knew. I just kind of thought, am I hearing things? Is this for real? And it was only eventually after many many months that I was eventually introduced to Patrick Ryan and it was only after you know meeting Patrick Ryan for a number of times and getting him to open up about his life and eventually getting him to agree to go on camera for that 2019 series and it was in the wake of that that I kind of thought oh there's a lot more to that story to tell 
and that's what's led to the book. But it's been it's been a long road to not only to meet Patrick Ryan, but to to get him to open up at all. Yeah, that, I'm really curious about that. Honestly, how did you get him to open up? Was it just the time was right for him or were you the right person or did you have something that you could offer him, for example, because he seems like a very tight lipped guy in so many ways throughout his most of his story anyway? Oh, Justin, he really, really is and very careful in what he says and what he does, even in a man decades on from his involvement with the IRA in the 1970s and 1980s, like decades on, you would know from speaking to him that he's a man that has spent a lot of his life in secret in terms of assessing people. You know, even in a coffee shop, he is he's looking around, he's casing the place, he is spotting people. So with all of that history in terms of his experiences and his character, which is extremely, extremely careful and private and measured, it really was. It was difficult to to get him to talk about his his experiences in Libya and in in Europe and further afield. I, I suppose it's kind of it's kind of that alchemy that kind of sometimes forms between a journalist and a source. You know, it's tenacity, it's patience. It's winning their trust, but it doesn't it doesn't happen overnight. And I guess that is the that's the luxury of being an investigative journalist is that sometimes you can kind of squirrel time away to kind of focus on, you know, on long term goals. So, it, you know, it was a long term goal to to meet him and to get him to speak. Hmm. So after all that time and after all of your meetings, did you still find him to be kind of an enigmatic figure? Because that was definitely my own takeaway from reading the books. Like I felt like I understood or I knew what he had done, but I didn't understand him as a person hardly at all, honestly. Yeah, I mean, I I don't think that's an incorrect kind of reading of, of his character. And I suppose in writing the book, I wanted to... I wanted to contextualize his story, his life, his experiences, and kind of put the you know the geopolitical situations around that story, and also to weave in some of the stories of the victims of the IRA's campaign of violence. And I mentioned that because you know it's not it's not I mean I didn't write it in a sentimental or I didn't romanticize what he did. But neither do I write it in a with a judgmental tone. You know, it really is up to it's left to the reader to judge, to judge his actions, to to judge his character. And yeah, no, he he is a difficult he he's a difficult man to pin down. Yeah, that's how I read it as well. And I've read quite a few books over the past couple of years on not so much just the troubles, but on generally on related areas, you know, espionage and covert activities and that sort of thing. And your objectivity, honestly, it really shined through in that I didn't feel like you were biased in either way. As I read through, you kind of matter of factly laid out what he had done and the after effects and all that, but without really taking sides, which is always very gratifying to see. Yeah, <laughs> so. I, I think that's an important principle, because if you listen to stories as a journalist with judgment, <laughs> you're going to tell those stories too with judgment. And I didn't that it's not my job to to do that. Right, right. That was that was great to see, honestly. So, Jennifer, can you take us back to his childhood then? I mean, he is a a child of Ireland and I know that his family had a long history of involvement in Irish independence and clashes with the British and that sort of thing. So, can you kind of set the stage on his life with that story? Yeah, he was born in 1930 in a county called Tipperary. That's in the south towards the south end of the the island of Ireland. And he is born to parents who have a small farm. He's the second eldest son and he's one of six children. Now, in the 1930s growing up, there was, of course, no television. There's no mobile phones. There's no distractions. You know, the, the, the entertainment, if you want to call it that, is based largely, you know, on the stories that, you know, children hear from their parents. And Patrick Ryan, his mother, Mary Ann, was a woman whose 
you know, formative experiences as a teenager was forged during the Irish War of Independence. Now, that there's a lot more detail in the book about that war and about her role, but essentially, in short, as a teenager, she would stand guard outside her home, listening out for the boots of the black and tan soldiers. That was a group of soldiers that were sent over as auxiliaries to to bolster, if you like, the police force at the time. And they had a they had a reputation for for acts of violence against those who wished to see Britain leave Ireland. So in short, she knew that if those soldiers knew that her family home was hiding men who were fighting the black and tans, if you like, and and fighting against the British forces in Ireland, she knew that at the very least, her home would be burned down. So she is an extremely strong Irish nationalist and patriot. You know, she tells her children those stories as they are growing up. So that, that identity is forged at a very early age within Patrick Ryan. You know, that deep love for his country, that inherent nationalism, albeit in his part, you know, it was it was militant Irish nationalism. So his outlook in life, his outlook towards Britain and that history of colonialism is formed in just that small house on a hill in County Tipperary growing up in the 1930s and, and 40s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it certainly felt to me like that his relationship with her and her relationship with Ireland was really the foundation that everything else was built on, certainly. And that's true to a certain extent for all of us, but it really shined through in your book as well. And it is fascinating, isn't it, how you know, there is that kind of bond between mothers and sons and how the sons can sometimes kind of carry the weight of the mother's view of the world. It is intriguing. And I know that many of your listeners would probably have analysed that in terms, you know, within terrorist groups in other parts of the world. But for Patrick Ryan, he held on to the stories his mother told him, but he also, like her, inherited that deep love for his country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating stuff. So what led him into the priesthood then as a young man? Well, as the second eldest son, it was, I suppose it was the birth order and a trauma of Irish history in terms of the Great Famine, which was in the 1800s, which meant that, you know, small family farm holdings were no longer, because of the famine, they were no longer being subdivided. So the eldest son, Simon, which uh, was Patrick's elder brother, he, he was in line to inherit the land, inherit the farm. And in the rural Ireland of that time, becoming a priest, having a priest in the family, having a Catholic priest in the family was the marker of respect. It elevated your family status within the community. And think of it this way, Justin. I mean, he enters the junior seminary before the before the end of world the Second World War. He's only 14 years of age when he enters the the seminary in Thurles in County Tipperary. And three years later, when he's 17, he becomes a formal priest in training. So, you know, by doing so, and he, you know, he, he speaks quite openly that that he had decided from an early age that he was going to become a priest. And he's adamant that nothing was ever decided for him in his life. And think of that kind of what it says about the character of, pers- of a person to be so, you know, to be so articulate and to be so forceful that nothing was ever decided for me in my life. So he goes in, he joins the priesthood and he is ordained in 1954, at 24 years of age. And within months, he is shipped off to East Africa, where he works for over a decade as a, as a missionary priest. You know, he's out there in the, in the missions that kind of, you know, think of it this way, Justin, there was a surplus of Irish priests and nuns, way too many for a small island like this. So they shipped them away 
and mm. it, and it, it become part part of Ireland's kind of spiritual empire, if you like to to borrow the phrase. And he's out there, and he he is doing good. I mean, he's building clinics, he's building hospitals, he's drilling for water. He's not standing around as he describes it with a catechism, with a you know a miniature Bible in his hand to teach children and and locals he you know he wants to get he's he's out there and he wants to get stuck into to building jobs yeah he certainly did not shy away from hard work from what i could tell and he was not afraid to get his hands dirty in any sense of the word i suppose would be a one way to put it exactly yeah so did that time that decade in africa did that impact his ultimate decision to help the IRA in any way? Was there any formative experiences there that pushed him in one path or another? Not in East Africa, although there he honed his engineering skills, which would come to the fore for the IRA much later in his life. But it's a curious twist of fate that lands Patrick Ryan back in Ireland. And the book goes into the detail of of what led to that. But he is back in Ireland in 1969 during the during that summer. And that is the summer when what became known as the Troubles, when the violence which led to that description begins to break out on the streets of, of Belfast and, and other parts of, of Northern Ireland. And at that stage, you know, Patrick Ryan is back in Ireland. He's taken up a post with his order. I am not making this up. He is driving around the country and he is collecting the the coins that have been tossed into missionary boxes for the East African missions. And he's collecting that money. Now, he's supposed to bring it to his superiors in Tipperary. And instead, he starts redirecting that money to the Republican movement across the border. Now, look, at that stage, you know, the money was not a lot. But of course, his superiors realise that there's a shortfall in the checks and they ask him, well, Father Patrick, you know, where where is this money? And he says he was quite open with them. I'm, I'm sending it north. And they are appalled. And at that stage, you know, he has, because he's based in Tipperary and he knows through the locality, some of the local IRA men, he has also simultaneously began to ferry to ferret out guns for the IRA and send them up north. So he is actively showing his hand, if you like, showing how interested he is in what the Irish Republican Army are doing at that stage and willing to, to get involved. And again, the book details it about how he eventually walks away from walks away from the church and you know gives himself over if you like to the IRA. Yes, that was that was very surprising for me and that was one of the biggest things that made it so hard for me to really get a read on him overall was the way that and I just didn't feel like there was any big turning point I guess or any kind of climactic moment that that changed the course of his life. He just started kind of doing this stuff like as, as soon as it was possible, I suppose. Is is that an accurate way to put it? That's certainly how it felt to me. Well, whatever he applies himself to, be it the time when he was East, in East Africa, or be it the time when he decides, you know, I am going to I am going to work full time for the IRA. Whatever he decides to do, he applies himself with absolute ruthlessness and clarity of vision. So you know, when he's a missionary priest, he's all in. When he begins to work for the IRA, equally and separately for a very different cause and end, he's all in. Every day, you're under attack, whether you realize it or not. Your digital devices contain your entire life, your finances, your conversations with friends and family, your interests, and even your movements. And all of that is vulnerable to an ever-expanding class of criminals, scam artists, hackers, and even governments. You don't want to leave your data security entirely in the hands of your ISP, or anyone else for that matter. It's up to you to protect yourself using a multi-layered defense strategy. 
Silent offers you the protection you need to keep your data and devices secure from wireless threats. Their multi-shield technology blocks cellular signals, GPS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, EMP, RFID, NFC, and more. Silent's lineup includes everything from signal blocking wallets all the way up to 40 cubic liter Faraday duffel bags. When you're geared up with Silent, you'll be truly disconnected, undetectable, untraceable, and unhackable. And you can now use the discount code SPYCRAFT101 to save 10% off your order from Silent. Find them at slnt.com. That's slnt.com. Hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, he's really, really very interesting character, certainly. So once he decides to start helping the IRA, does he join a particular group or does he contact someone high ranking and and ask for how he can help or something like that? Like, how does this all begin? He's introduced to a local IRA commander who makes it known that this intriguing character is willing to help. And think of it this way as well, Justin. You know, Patrick Ryan at that stage, he is very well educated. You know, he has spent years studying for his priesthood. You know, at that stage, he speaks, you know, at least four languages. Hmm. He is he he is somebody who the IRA, you know, senior IRA leaders recognized he could be valuable to us. And there was a, a shipment of arms that came from Libya in 1972. And you'll be aware that Gaddafi at that time very much saw the, the IRA as comrades in arms, if you like, fighting British imperialism. So he, you know, he is oil, you know, oil beyond measure. He has so much money to give away to terrorist organizations around the world. He has made it known that he's willing to help the IRA. The the gun running or the weapons running mission that the first one that Patrick Ryan was involved in is, is detailed in the book. It's called the Claudia Arms Operation. And it's an intriguing story of, you know, a spy at the center of this shipment of arms and, and why the shipment of arms was compromised. But long story short, Patrick Ryan was sent back to Libya at that time to work full time as as a type of diplomat, as a type of fixer to be the link man between the IRA and Gaddafi. And he does so on a couple of conditions. And one of them being that he has decided that he will never join the IRA in a formal sense. He's not, as they would have described it, green booked, which was a quite a strategic and clever move on his part because it it made him kind of one step removed from the the discipline of the of the IRA. He didn't have to, he was his own man, he didn't have to answer to their rules. There was no risk of him being being hauled in and being queried as to why he did not follow, you know, in inverted commas, orders. And he also decided that he would work full time for them on the basis that if any of the money, if he learned that any of the money that he was funneling from Libya back to Ireland was being misdirected or misused in any way, that that he would walk away from the operation. So he had put those two kind of, those two markers down but like I said, when he started to work for them, he, you know, he was he was ruthless. It's amazing stuff. It really is. And the way that he could ultimately become the conduit between this North African dictator, essentially, and the and the IRA, it seems like he was just the right guy for the job. I, I believe he did meet with Gaddafi once or twice, didn't he? And they, there was a level of mutual respect there. Yeah, he did. You know, in in Tripoli, he was dealing with a lot of senior Libyan intelligence people and he did meet Gaddafi. He is loath to talk in any detail about him, which I find, you know, I, you know, I found I found it intriguing. But he he did meet with them. He spoke of somebody who was very well informed who he had lot you know lots of conversations 
with. But what's curious also is that when he was dealing with his senior contacts in Tripoli, they rarely spoke in any explicit way about the amount of money that Libya was providing to the IRA. It was almost like they would talk about anything else except the most obvious thing in the room. But I think because in Patrick Ryan, they had somebody who not only was he willing to take money from the Gaddafi regime, he was also willing, if necessary, to make himself available to Gaddafi's network in Europe. And some of those instances are, are detailed in the book. So when you say he was he was the right man for the right job, he absolutely was because he didn't have the you know he didn't have a family back in Ireland that he that he was desperately pining for when he was traveling across Europe, setting up Swiss bank accounts for the money and other such things. He wasn't bound by you know any structures. He had that kind of self inherent discipline that was honed in the when he was training to be a priest. He was somebody who inherently is very careful, very cunning. So he was the right he was the right character profile for the IRA to have in situ for that job. Hmm. That's yeah, what a guy. What a guy. Very, very fascinating character to me. I really, really wish I understood him a little bit better, like I said, but I'm really glad that you had the opportunity to talk to him so much and, and at least get some insight for us. Jennifer, how exactly did he smuggle this cash back to Northern Ireland? What was the physical method? Was he taking it on in like in check baggage on flights or was it coming in via ship, something like that? It was most the Padre, the book kind of details the network of, of what I described as sleepers, IRA people who would, you know, literally be bag bag men and women carrying bags of money between France and Ireland. Patrick Ryan, when he was in Tripoli, was never getting on a flight from Tripoli back to back to Paris more often with, you know, bags of cash. It was quite cleverly set up in that all he had to do was go to the embassy in Rome or Paris, make contact with his link person on the ground, and the cash would be supplied to him directly. And mm. he had that network set up, and then eventually he set up some Swiss bank accounts so that he could, you know, keep the money in situ before the next tranche of it could be redirected back to Ireland. Uh, nice. But he he was quite clever in the way he set it up. Yeah, certainly. And it worked very well for him and for the organization for quite some time as well, I know. So I know that the smuggling of the cash wasn't his only contribution. He had a big role to play in the actual bomb making as well, didn't he? Yes. I mean, it it is really difficult. And I suppose it's it's not difficult. It would be it would be remiss of me to not to focus on what Patrick Ryan did for the IRA in terms of their the, the capacity to bomb. And again, the Padre, the book details this. He is, he is, he's got a camper van at one stage in Europe for getting around different countries where he's meeting his contacts. And, and at one stage in the mid 19 or the early, early 1970s, he's in Geneva. He notices a little timer that motorists at the time used in Europe. They're called memo park timers. And, you know, you'd park your car somewhere and you'd put the money in the meter and you'd have this little tiny pocket timer and you set it for the hour or however long you have to get back to your car. And it, it, and it goes off to remind you, get back quick before, before a car parking steward gives you a ticket. So Patrick Ryan sees this little timer. Now, at that stage, Justin... He knows that IRA bomb makers and persons who are planting bombs are, you know, in short, kind of blowing themselves up during what the IRA describes, described as own goals. So he knows that, you know, as he says, on dark, frosty nights when there's, you know, men with gloves on 
and they're trying to put a, a bomb under somebody's car, more often a, a policeman, policeman's car or the like, there's, there's the risk that the bomb will detonate early. So he, the, the book details how he re-engineered the timers and he sent, he, he bought them in bulk, hundreds and hundreds of them, sent back his template of his re-engineering of the timing device back to the IRA in Ireland. They, t- they act on his instructions. And in short, he has made it easier for the IRA to train bomb makers and he made the timers, the re-engineering of the timers makes it safer for those planting the bombs to do so. And the memo park timers and the timing power unit that the that the IRA set up, and of course, it's a baseline on which they improvise, but the memo park timers in particular, Justin, become a hallmark of IRA bombs, and they were used in scores of, of IRA bombs from the mid-1970s onwards. So oh Patrick Ryan, you know, the former Catholic priest, he's not just funneling money. He's also had a hand in transforming the IRA's capacity to bomb and to wreak absolute carnage. Hmm. Incredible stuff. So the the memo park, excuse me, the memo park timers were used scores of times and all of them, every single one of them came from Father Ryan on that trip to Geneva, ultimately. Well, if they hadn't been purchased on that particular trip in Geneva, mm-hmm. he certainly made it his business okay, to get right. as many memo park timers back to back to the IRA. I see. OK. Yeah, that's quite a quite a legacy he's left there and all because they kind of caught his eye in the, the window of the shop, if I recall correctly. And he knew enough about mechanical engineering to really adapt them for use in these in these weapons. Yes, he describes it in the book. They were the little timers that made all the difference. Yeah. Now, that statement carries so much trauma and pain for those who, you know, who lost loved ones in IRA bombs. Um, oh, so I, I you know I don't say that with any particular agenda or, you know, it's, I say it in, in an objective way. It, that is his story. That's what he did. And, and that's why yeah. it was important in the book to to weave in some of the stories of, of, of victims who, who lost their lives in, in IRA bombs. Absolutely. Yeah. All the difference that that term, that's a, a very loaded euphemism in this context, certainly. And it's something that changed so many lives and ended so many lives as well. It's really unfortunate, but it's fascinating that it comes down to him just noticing something and acting on it and making such a significant impact in over so many years on the conflict there really is really something interesting. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like you said, it's just the, it, it was just walking past a shop in Geneva when he spotted the timers and, Mm -hmm. you know, he had, he had a mathematical brain. He was very good at engineering. He had already learned how to fly a plane when he was in East Africa. I say that only, you know, in terms of how, mechanically minded he was he was a gift to the ira Mm -hmm. and equally to the opposite end he you know it was a horror for people who were caught up in in ira bombings Mm -hmm. no doubt no doubt about it so ultimately i know that to at least a certain extent his luck ran out and he was arrested at some point wasn't he yes now i mean the, the the story and the lead up and all his careering around Europe because he's there, you know, he's working for the IRA from the early 1970s. There's a period in the early 1980s when he has a falling out with the IRA leadership and the book details that, but it's not until 1988. At that stage, he had long based himself in Benidorm in Spain where he had purchased a flat and he has, he was traveling from Benidorm to Brussels, another city that he knew very well for other nefarious reasons. And those details are in the book, but it's not until 1988, Belgian police arrest him. And the detail as to 
what's led to that arrest and why he is only detained and not charged with anything. That is all in the book. But he he's in a, a Belgian prison in 1988. And of course, the British Prime Minister at that time, Margaret Thatcher, and her government have been themselves subject, you know, targets of IRA bombs. For example, the you know, it's it's only a couple of years since the bomb at Brighton went off, which killed five people and almost almost killed the British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. And mm. that bomb, incidentally, had a memo park timer used in it. So they clearly British intelligence are aware at that stage of who Patrick Ryan is and what he has been up to. And they want him extradited from Belgium back to London so that he can face charges in a in an English court. And, it, you know, his arrest becomes this major political fight between the, the Belgian government on one hand and the British government on the other. Yeah, I can't imagine how excited the British were to finally hopefully get their hands on him. But ultimately, they wound up very, very frustrated by the Belgian government itself, right? Yes, because the Belgian government, and again, you know, all of the colour and the detail is in the book about this. And it is absolutely fascinating because they decided that they would repatriate Patrick Ryan back to Ireland and they fly him out of Brussels on a Belgian military plane, deliberately avoiding British airspace. And he lands back in Dublin airport. And at that stage, he had he had gone on hunger strike for a number of days in protest. But in short, as he says it, there was nothing at all that was, you know, he was not close to death. He was he was in relatively good medical, you know, condition. Then the British decide, the British government decides, okay, well, the Belgians haven't extradited him. Let's see if the Irish authorities will extradite him from Ireland to London. And that is also turned down for reasons which largely can be traced back to Margaret Thatcher and what she said in the House of Commons about Patrick Ryan. But in short, he has never faced any court of law for his activities in relation to the IRA and what he did for them. He wasn't extradited from Dublin to London in the 1980s. And you and your listeners will be aware that, you know, eventually in the 1990s, what had long been in situ in terms of secret talks between the Irish, British governments and and the IRA itself and other paramilitaries in Northern Ireland eventually led to a peace agreement called the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. Patrick Ryan has never faced any court for his IRA activities and on his return to Ireland in the 1990s there was an opportunity as he describes it to start up what he describes as another outfit, one that would, you know, and I am, you know, using his, I'm using his terms, his descriptions, one that would have maintained the fight, if you like, against, against the British. But he, he has walked away from the Republican movement at that stage. But, you know, Justin, his, his story is incredible. And one would think it's almost fiction were it not for the fact that, you know, the British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, sitting across from her Irish counterpart in the late 1980s, confirms a lot of the details that we know now about Patrick Ryan, that he was the main channel of contact between the IRA and Gaddafi from from the early 70s up to the mid 80s. Yeah, I agree. It was sounds stranger than fiction in so many ways. And the fact that he was able to walk away from all of that Despite, I mean, Margaret Thatcher being personally upset with him continuing to live free and unfettered, that's that's usually a bad sign for a lot of people. But he was able to walk away from all of that with relatively few consequences, despite everything that we know 
now it, it really is shocking, but that's what makes it so endlessly fascinating as well. Yeah, it, it is. An, it is an incredible story. You know, the the boy who was born to, you know, who, who was born in, in, on a small farm in County Tipperary, who went on to become a missionary priest and eventually transformed the IRA's capacity to bomb and became their link man between the IRA and Gaddafi, funneling what he says were many millions from the Libyan regime to the IRA. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, Jennifer, what happened after the Good Friday Agreement? What did he do with the rest of his life, essentially? What happened between now and then? Well, he's still alive. He is, he's 93 years of age now. In the years since mm -hmm. the Good Friday Agreement, he's lived a life largely on the margins of Irish society. Now, when I say that, he is somebody who has had interactions with some notorious but now dead criminals in Dublin. One example is Martin Cahill, who was known as the, the general, who was a prolific criminal in Ireland in, in the 1970s and 80s, and who eventually himself was shot dead by the IRA in Dublin before they went on, on their ceasefire. I mention that only to say that Patrick Ryan is somebody, you know, he moved in the, on the mar you know, he, he kind of lived within the margins of society for a long time. He lives, you know, a quiet life now, but he has had, a, you know, an incredible and destructive, some people would say, part to play in the, in the IRA and in Irish history. And in turn, his life story kind of, touches on those pinch points of of not just Irish history but also like geopolitical events that was you know unfolding you know in the 1980s between President Reagan and Gaddafi and the British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher you know he is he's just kind of operating amongst all those different kind of geopolitical weeds if you know if, if you like all those kind of kind of pinch points mm -hmm. certainly so when you had the opportunity to talk to him so many years after all of this has transpired, did you get any sense that he regretted any of his actions or the, you know, the ultimate consequences of those? Or is he still just as fired up now as he was at the time for Irish independence? Very much the latter, albeit he's not in any way, you know, hands on or agitating or you know, involved in, in anything nowadays, but he's, the, the beliefs that he had, you know, then he very much holds now. And I think what people have found, well, I know from speaking to people who have, you know, read the book or who have, you know, who have spoken to about Patrick Ryan, what they have found particularly shocking is that he doesn't have any regrets. He doesn't have any remorse about hmm. the victims of IRA bombings. His only regret, if you can call it that, is that he wasn't more effective. That the that what he wasn't that the bombs he had a hand in didn't kill more. Now that is a shockingly painful assertion for many people to hear more so because it's coming from somebody who you know was was at one time you know this moral arbiter of of people's lives in terms of the the catholic religion but he's it's what he believes he he you know Absolutely. when he says it he doesn't deliver it with any sort of bravado i mean of course it's a, an incredibly you know an incredibly difficult thing for people to hear but it's, it's what he believes and it is shocking. Yeah, it certainly is. What a fascinating character he was. And I'm, I'm really glad that we had the opportunity to talk about him and that I had the chance to read your book and that you had a chance to interview him and write it to begin with, Jennifer. So this has been really, really interesting stuff and I appreciate it. Are you working on another book now or anything else now that The Padre is published? Um, I have a couple of other ideas and <laughs> which you believe I'm, of course, I am trying to track down a couple of other intriguing characters. But yeah, no, I, I do. I do have some ideas, but, you know, there was a lot of a lot of work and research went into this book, The Padre. And, you know, 
he is an intriguing character and I am really delighted that anybody would give their time and their their money over to you know to to buying the book and and to reading it and being open to to that story of Irish history especially because I know from meeting many of the victims that it's not something that's historic to so many families here it's it's very much a living a living grief mm. I can I can certainly see that I can certainly see that I can tell you that just my own experiences here on this podcast is that my listeners are just endlessly hungry for to learn more about these types of stories. So I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk to you about it. And I think that they're really going to learn a lot from this as well. Jennifer, is there anywhere that people can connect with you online? Do you have social media accounts or public page, anything like that for people to look you up afterwards? Yeah. So I'm on Twitter. It's at Jen underscore O underscore Leary. But I mean, if you Google Jennifer O'Leary, you know, BBC, Twitter, you know, it should, it should come up or, or, or should I be calling it X now? Um, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. And I'm on Instagram as well. So they can, they can contact me and, I, and I'm also on LinkedIn. And yes, would love to hear what people make of the book. I'm really interested, really, really interested to hear that. Okay, fantastic. That's good to know. We'll definitely link that up in the show notes as well so people can find it more easily. For those of you who are listening, if you want to read a lot more about his story, we've, in so many ways, we've only just scratched the surface of Father Ryan's story here. The book is called The Padre by Jennifer O'Leary, and it doesn't just talk about his story in depth and everything that he did during the Troubles, but it also gives you a lot of the larger history surrounding it, surrounding some of the actual bombings and some of the other major characters. So <clears throat> it's a wonderful introduction to the history of the Troubles if you haven't read anything about that particular period yet. So I definitely encourage you to do that. Well, thank you again, Jennifer. This has been really enlightening and I, I very much appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Justin. It was lovely speaking to you. Wonderful. Take care. Don't forget, you can download a free copy of the prologue to Jennifer's book, The Padre. Just click the link in the show notes of this episode to have it emailed to you. And if you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.